Without selection achieving it, the evolving biosphere is creating the possibilities into which it will flow. It's an unfolding. It's creating its own possibilities for future evolution. I think this is just stunning. Greetings, future fossils. This is Michael Garfield welcoming you to episode 125 of the Art, Science, and Philosophy podcast that explores our place in time. This week's conversation with the esteemed complexity scientist Stuart Kaufman is probably the headiest episode of the show I have released so far. It's a real treat to get to share this with you, especially because this week we stand on the very precipice of my second podcast for the Santa Fe Institute, the organization I learned about through Stuart Kaufman uh, 15 years ago. So really, this exchange about the emergence of order and the self-organizing properties of the evolutionary process and its products represents the culmination of nearly half a life of my own thinking and an entire life of Stuart's thinking. Uh, he'll be turning 80 later this month, and it's a truly proper springboard for the kind of conversations that I'm currently editing for Complexity Podcast, and uh, you ought to be keeping your ears out for in the weeks to come. We get into some extremely deep and wonderful terrain here about the origins of life, about how order emerges from chaos, about the very nature of randomness. I'm really excited to dunk all of you into this profound and challenging conversation. And I think you can tell from the recording that uh, sitting down in Stuart's house with him to have what ended up being over three hours of deep and intense exchange was really kind of intimidating for me as someone who has come to these ideas largely outside of the academic context and has really only recently found a community within which I can have this kind of conversation at the level and the, the rigor that you start to see on display here. I think Stewart's legacy of research into what he calls the adjacent possible, the way that life creates new opportunities for life in a kind of ongoing bootstrapping kind of way, is one of the most empowering and important ideas that has ever been on future fossils. And even if you weren't really prepared to bite into an hour and a half of physics, I think you will be richly rewarded for doing so. Before we get into it, I want to express my profound gratitude to all 140 of my Patreon supporters, including this week's newest, Isar Webb. You make this show possible. I'm not doing this show for ad revenue. I understand that these kinds of conversations appeal to a specific kind of person, someone interested in interrogating the margins of our experience, and that for that reason, this show will probably never be a commercial success. So your listener support is really the deciding factor about how long this show can continue. Your contributions go directly to affording the time and the energy it takes to prepare for, to record, to edit, produce, and publish this podcast, which is an enormous amount of work, something like 15 hours a week, that I have to find time for on top of full-time work and being a new parent. And so even though I'm used to giving away all all of my creative work. I'm making a point to reserve some of the juiciest bits for Patreon supporters, including the second half of this conversation in which Stuart and I discuss his work on quantum physics and consciousness and his proposed resolution to the so-called hard problem, the marriage of spirit and matter. Patreon supporters at various levels are also entitled to a number of perks, including original art and music, like the music you hear on this show, more secret episodes all the time, and the Future Fossils Book Club, which is currently in the middle of three excellent conversations on Xi Jin Liu's Three Body Problem trilogy, a, a remarkable work of Chinese science fiction that I'm really excited to hop back in and discuss with everyone on Sunday, September 15th, when we cover the second book, The Dark Forest. So if you're interested in these things, or you just appreciate what this show brings to your life, you feel that it enriches you in some way, 
then hop on over to patreon.com slash Michael Garfield and join our little community. Also, I have forgotten to mention this for months on the show, but Future Fossils Podcast has a Facebook group with over 2,000 people in it. Our discussions are lively and inspiring, and you'll meet some extraordinary people in there. So please, everyone into the pool, get in there and uh, let's see what self-organizes. And that's it for now. Uh, Enjoy this remarkable conversation with Stuart Kaufman, and I'll see you next week. Stuart Kaufman, it is a pleasure to have you on Future Fossils. Well, thank you, Michael. I'm very glad to be on Future Fossils. At 80, I am one. (laughs) Well, I'm not quite 80. So you're someone whose work I have been glancing off of since I was in college, right around the turn of the millennium. You were one of the first people whose work I encountered when I started asking questions about whether there was in fact, a direction to evolution, which at least in the the curriculum in the evolutionary sciences as of 2005 was still a taboo question. Yeah. But I think that that's just an indication that the future is distributed unevenly (laughs) because, you know, you and your colleagues uh, were doing really compelling, well-argued work on this in the 90s, like 10 years before I started asking this question. Mm -hmm. So this is a great opportunity for us to to talk about the evolution of biospheres and um, I don't know, whatever else comes up. So good. Yeah. So um, I think the place to start would be just to talk about the adjacent possible, which is this fabulous term that you coined and how, how to think about the adjacent possible in evolution and in what that means for folks, if you want to just lay that out. Okay. Uh, I guess I came up with the term around 1980s, late 80s. Uh, I, I remember uh, Richard Palmer, who uh, was a physicist who was uh, part of the early say saying, saying we should call it the circumjacent possible. I thought, that's just, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the adjacent possible uh, is... Given what's actually around now, what can come to be next? What can arise next? So here are some examples. Um, it happens in the evolution of the biosphere. It's here in the presence of the in the evolution of the economy. It may be true for the abiotic universe too. I, I don't know what to say about that. But let's to take a simple example. Once there are fish, the emergence of amphibia are in the adjacent possible of the biosphere. Once there are Amphibia, reptiles are in the adjacent possible of the biosphere. Um, once there are mammals, uh, hominids are in the adjacent possible of the biosphere, and it doesn't go the other way. Uh, once there are prokaryotes, uh, uh, archaea, and bacteria, multicelled organisms are in the adjacent possible of the biosphere. Uh, we can talk about Darwinian pre-adaptations in a moment if you want to. But in the economy, uh, a fun example for me is, uh, you know, once there's television sets with more than one channel, the channel changer is the adjacent possible of the economy. But you better have a couch potato. And so the, the evolution of the economy is the same thing. And it keeps happening over and over. Uh, take the economy. Uh, 50,000 years, 2 million years ago, with Australia Pithecus, there's maybe 10 goods and services in the global economy, very, very rudimentary tools. Two million years later, two and a half million years later, you have Homo sapiens. Well, cro had maybe two or three hundred kinds of tools, ranging in complexity from an arrowhead to, to an atlatl, which is a spear thrower, which is terrific. You could attack aurochs, you, you know, from a distance and leave your spear at them rather than running up to them and stabbing them. Uh, sometime later, uh, sometimes later, you get to uh, Mesopotamia with thousands of goods ranging in complexity from uh, needles to chariots. Then you get to modernity with billions of goods ranging from needles to space stations. Well, you couldn't get a space station until you had uh, rockets and you were out in space. So rocketry from Goddard and so on and World War II, once you had rocketry, the space station was the adjacent possible of the economy. Uh, once you had cell phones, 
uh, apps on cell phones run the adjacent possible the economy. It's all it's all over the place. And it's it's interesting that nobody said it. It's it's kind of not profound. It's kind of obvious. Anyway, it seems to be there. It seems to be an important part of the evolution of complex systems. Yeah, I mean, you know, to me, that always seemed to be core to the question of the origins of life, you know, where you spent most of your career mm -hmm. sort of in a uh, potentially chaotic orbit around, I was. around that topic. So, like, the adjacent possible mm -hmm. is related to this notion of niche construction. Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, the, the like the, the two plus two equals five of emergence, mm -hmm. um, it seems as though it's, I don't know if explained away is the right way of talking about this, but it's made sense by understanding how the intersection of things creates a new shape. And that in that shape, literally, you know, like, the, the, like niche in this sort of original concrete sense, mm -hmm. a new niche is created. And so we get into these kind of interesting areas with it. And maybe we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves talking about the actual and the potential. No, but perfectly fine. You're yeah. on target. <laughs> but there seems as though what we recognize as emergent order is latent in all of these systems, even before they assemble. But that at, at any rate, the, this proliferation of goods that you're talking about, mm -hmm. for example, it's because every technology is like, uh, you know, multicellular life forms, it's built out of simpler technologies, mm -hmm. remixed into new ways, mm -hmm. right? And so there's like yeah. the sense that we are, well, that, you know, this stepwise process, you know, where, mm -hmm. whereby the, the adjacent possible is extended through novel arrangements of whatever is already there. Mm -hmm. It has something to do with, at least at, at the human level, our ability to perceive opportunity. Yep. And so there's a sense in which the adjacent possible, you know, like Buckminster Fuller talks about how all of the resources we'll ever need are already here. Mm -hmm. And, and that there's a sense in which we do or do not perceive them. You know, like, mm -hmm. like I think a lot about this as a, as a musician, that there's a certain number of culturally accepted ways to play a guitar, mm -hmm. but that there's some unknown number of possible other ways that mm -hmm. a human being can relate to you know, whatever, a tool or instrument of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems as though the adjacent possible and all of the sort of new niches afforded there, all of the affordances of these, these new combinations are in, are in some way very dependent on the agents of that system and their ability to, like, the, the adjacent possible is, is, like, circumscribed by the cognitive capacities of the system itself. I mean, is this, am I making any sense here? Do you, I mean, yes and no. So let me okay. try to say yeah. the no part of it first. The adjacent possible is there for evolving archaea and bacteria two and a half billion years ago. And it's there for the earliest forms of multicellular life. And it's there with the Cambrian explosion and it's there with the evolution of plants. So for the moment, let's not attribute consciousness to bacteria. I mean, maybe they are, but let's okay. leave that out. I don't think you need consciousness uh, for this story. Uh, I do think there's some parts that you need. You've already said it. It's not just niche construction in which the images of the bower bird, you know, gathering the, the blue ribbon to put in its bower so a cute girl bower bird will come and they'll have babies. It's niche creation. So organisms create niches for one another, and new organisms create niches for organisms that can live in the niche that they provide. Uh, I just So I've written on this for some time. Roberto uh, Gatti will be here this week. Uh, he's written on, in fact, we're all writing papers together, uh, sitting in my books going back some time, named Niche Creation. But Brian Arthur talks about this also in his book, The Nature of Technology. We don't have much of a theory for it, uh, but let's look at some examples that, that I've thought about for some time uh, in technology. So Turing invents a Turing machine. That does not cause, but it enables the invention of the mainframe computer. Well, von Neumann comes along and invents the founding. The mainframe computer does not cause, but because it's sold into wide markets, it creates the market for, it enables, uh, along with the invention of the chip, the personal computer. The personal computer uh, makes possible word processing, which is the complement 
the technological complement of, of uh, the the, uh, the uh, word processing. Given that you've got a main, given that you've got a personal computer, you can use it to do word processing. And then for word processing, you get to the World Wide Web. Then you get to selling on the web, and then you get content on the web, and you get Google. So this is the kind of unfolding we're talking about, in which the the bias the econosphere keeps evolving into its adjacent possible. Nobody knew 200 years ago that we were going to have the World Wide Web. So this is part of the fact that you can't restate it. So the same thing is true that I've already said in the evolution of the biosphere, and it comes to something important that that uh, that I started to realize in my, uh, I guess, fourth book, Reinventing the Sacred, where I wrote this chapter called Breaking the Galilean Spell. And then it came to its first real fruition in a paper with my Monte Villa, Giuseppe Longo, and me in 2012. And it's captured by the screwdriver argument. It takes a long time to find the right argument. So here it is, if you've not heard it. So, Michael, here's the screwdriver. Here, I'm giving it to you. Please tell me all the things you could do with this screwdriver right here in Santa Fe in 2019. So go ahead and tell me. What can you do with the screwdriver? I'm serious. Tell me. Besides using it as a... Well, include using it as, as a, a screwdriver. As a screwdriver sure, or wrong. as a you know, personal defense yeah. or a doorstop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah there's, there's a set of things... Uh, Potentially a musical instrument. Okay. Um, reset your wireless internet router. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll let me go on for a couple. Of melt minutes. it down and use it as the basis for a three D printer. <laughs> okay. And, yeah. Yeah, you can use it to, to wedge a door closed or open, or as an objet d'art, or to stab somebody, or to scrape putty off the window. Uh, among my favorites are you, you tie it to stick and spear a fish. <laughs> and then you rent the spur out to the locals to take 5% of the catch. Or my actual favorite is you lean it against the wall, a horizontal to the wall, put a piece of plywood on top of it and put a wet painting underneath to keep the rain off of it so the painting dries. That's a perfectly fine use of a screwdriver. So I'm not going to come to two questions. There's obviously a lot of uses of a screwdriver, you know, here in Santa Fe today. Um, do you think the number of uses is infinite? Is it a definite number like 17, or is it indefinite? I would imagine it to be indefinite. Everybody says the same thing. I don't know how you mathematically prove indefinite, right? but it is. It's indefinite. It's going to have a lot of consequences. It can't be infinite, right? No. Unless we live in an infinite cosmos. It can't be, because in order to get to infinity, you need an iterative procedure like n plus 1 which goes off to give you the number theory to infinity. You have a, a procedure to get to the next one. So let's take indefinite. So the number of uses of a screwdriver is indefinite. What other piece? There's four kinds of ordering relationships in mathematics. A nominal scale, which is the names of things. Uh, an ordering relationship that x is greater than y, and y is greater than z. So it's transitive, so x is greater than z. An interval scale like a thermometer, but zero means nothing, and a ratio scale like a meter stick. So two meters is twice one. What are these as screwdrivers? Well, it's just a nominal scale, right? It's just the names of things. Agreed? Mm -hmm. So there's no ordering relationship. I think that implies something really important. It implies that no algorithm, no rule following procedure a la Turing, can list all the uses of screwdrivers, and it cannot list the next use of a screwdriver. You can't get from using a screwdriver to from scraping putty off the wall to uh, selling a spear with a stick attached to it to get 5% of the cash. It's just something different. That means that uses of screwdrivers and new uses of screwdrivers is not an algorithmic thing. It's fundamental. And the reason it's fundamental is that technological evolution and the evolution of the biosphere are over and over and over again finding new so let me say that the new use of the screwdriver literally cannot be set ahead of time. It's unprecedentable. It's just unprecedentable. And this is going to mean, which we, Giuseppe Longo and I and Milo, feel that we nailed in our 2012 paper, the title of which is No Entailing Laws, But Enablement in the Evolution of the Biosphere. So this is going to say that Newton and reductionism stops at the watershed of life. It just does. And if it's right, it's really an important result that is still hiding in the marshes somewhere. So uh, let me describe for us and your listeners what a Darwinian pre-adaptation is. So if you ask Darwin, you know, why does, uh, why does, uh, 
Why does Kaufman have a heart? He just said, well, the function of the heart is to pump blood. Notice that the heart makes heart sounds and it wiggles water in your pericardium. It's like, that's not the function of the heart. So the function of the heart, first of all, is a subset of its causal consequences. A big question is why the hearts exist in the universe. Right, because that's a retradiction. Right. Yes. I mean, it's all, it's panglossian in a sense. Yes. So come up with this, yeah. But it is the function of your heart to pump blood. It really is. So one question that I get to in my last book is, so why are there hearts in the universe? Well, let's come back to that later. Because the universe is non-ergotic above the level of atoms. The universe has made all possible 120 stable atoms. It cannot make all possible proteins length 200. In got zillions of times the history of the universe. So the universe is non-ergotic above the level of atoms. So why are there hearts? Most complex things will never exist. Let's come back to that. I think it's really important. Anyway, here's the Darwinian pre-adaptation. So Darwin realized that a causal consequence of an organ, like heart sounds, of no functional significance in the current environment, like the heart was selected to pump blood, but you could imagine environments that may be selectively advantageous uh, that the heart makes heart sounds. So a wacky example is the heart makes heart sounds. So, so, so it's a resonant chamber, so it can maybe pick up earthquake pretremors. And I happen to have a dominant mutation, so I'm really good at picking up earthquake pretremors. And I do the right thing in Los Angeles. I hide in a building or something, and millions are killed. And I've got this dominant mutation, and I mate with many, which is harder to eat. Pretty soon there's lots of little coffins running around, and they've got earthquake detectors in their chest. So a new function has come to exist in the biosphere. Well, of course, that's silly. But it's not silly in the fact that it happens all the time. So my favorite example, do you know about swim bladders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know? That's unusual. Anyway, um, some fish have swim bladders. Their sacs partially filled with air and water, and the ratio of the two adjusts neutral buoyancy in the water column. So paleontologists think that swim bladders arose from lungfish, and some water got into the lungs, and so it was poised to become a swim bladder. Well, and did a new function come to it? Sure, neutral buoyancy in the water column. Could you have said it ahead of time? No, go back two billion years. Could you have said swim bladders? No. It's a new function. It's a new right. functionality. I think the same with the leg. Like, it's obvious that the leg didn't evolve for getting around on the ground. Right. You know, it evolved probably... out of the fins of fish. Right, yeah. So the way I've come to say this is something like the following. Imagine a bacterial population and some bacteria is in some new environment. And it turns out that a property that it already has is useful to accomplish a new task, like using the screwdriver for a new task. So if there's heritable for variation for that new property, it will come to exist in the biosphere. In short, if a molecular screwdriver has some property that allows the organism to be fitter in a given environment, a new, it'll be, it might be selected and a new function will come to exist in the biosphere. But that means something big that, that Longo and uh, Milo and I realized. In physics, you can always pre-state the phase space of the system. So a, a simple example is a billiard table of the billiard balls. The boundaries of the billiard table tell you all possible combinations of positions and momenta of the balls. That is the phase space of the system. And if you change the boundary conditions, you change the phase space. You can't so what's happening in biological evolution, it takes about two sentences, is the functions of things are part of the phase space of evolution. It matters that there are swim bladders, the evolution of fish, and it matters that there are hearts to the evolution of the biosphere. But you cannot say ahead of time, from the screwdriver argument, the ever-changing phase space of biological evolution or technological evolution. You can't say it. You cannot pre-state it. It's not a matter of prediction. You can't pre-state it. And that means the following. You cannot write down equations of motion. Newton did for billiard balls. You cannot state what the boundary conditions are, uh, like the table. Uh, therefore, since there's no equations of motion in differential form like Newton, you can't integrate the equations to get the entailed trajectories of the balls on the table. So there are no laws whatsoever for the evolution of the biosphere. Okay, now, now, now wait a minute, because... Something that seems like a stronger argument now than it did 10 years ago is that this question of life organizing seemingly in opposition to entropy mm -hmm. is being rephrased so that 
life as you know, like Prigogine's dissipative structure, yep. as as a, a way for energy to distribute through an environment more effectively, yep. means that all of the order we observe in the world is, in the words of uh, Richard Doyle at Penn State, that the evolution is a search algorithm searching this, the phase space of all possible forms for those organisms and ecologies that are in some sense an answer to entropy maxima. I'm sure you mean entropy production. Yes. So in a way, like you said, this invention or this evolutionary novelty enables but does not cause the next thing. In the sense that evolutionary novelties or new technologies, if we even need to talk about those as two different things, are changing the phase space, yeah. right? Opening the phase space mm -hmm. up into, into this adjacent possible. Mm -hmm. And therefore changing the terms by which one would attempt to even make a prediction about the next state of the system. But we know that there is still this, you know, we can still predict that this next state exists. So like there's this issue about like evolutionary contingency versus evolutionary inevitability, right? Like we, like mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Kelly put it in what technology wants, like mm -hmm. in a way we could predict the internet, but we couldn't necessarily predict the iPhone as like the, the means by which this greater, mm -hmm form of organization would instantiate itself. So given that we know in, that in some sense, this may be, this meaning the biosphere, may be driving into the adjacent possible because it's maximizing for entropy production, doesn't that suggest that even if we individually lack the imagination to predict the next thing that fits into that newly created niche, we can get pretty well guarantee that something is going to go there because the niche is there because that the, the free energy has been made available. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the adjacent possible has, has become adjacent, has become, you know, totally adjacent. visible to mm -hmm. the system in some way. And so you end up with, you know, like parallel inventions, like 23 people invent the light bulb at the same time. Right. So how do you, how do you weigh that? between this being non-ergodic, non-algorithmic, and there not being a law for it. And yet at the same time, the whole playing board is tilted towards right. this opening and, right. and filling all of the new openings that it creates. It's a bunch to say. Yeah. So I want to go back and tell you something that, that I realized with my wife Liz about 10, 10 years ago, sitting right out on the patio. And I was thinking about Darwinian pre-adaptations. And then... I realized something, and uh, it's really, it really surprised me. So, so let's take the subladder. So claim one is we could not pre-state the subladder, or more broadly, we cannot pre-state all possible Darwinian pre-adaptations that are going to happen in evolution. That's right. But the next thing is the following. Uh, do we think natural selection had something to do with crafting a functioning subladder without personalizing that. And of course it did. They're selected for functioning subladders. But once the subladder exists, it is now possible that a worm or a bacterium could evolve to live only in subladders, right? Mm -hmm. So that's an adjacent possible empty niche that was created by the subladders coming into existence. By the way, notice that the subladder doesn't cause it, it, ent it enables it, which is in our paper. Well, so what struck me one day is, do we think that natural selection selected subladders such that there would be an adjacent possible empty niche into which worms could evolve. No. But that means something just amazing. And it's going to be true for the economy, too. Without selection achieving it, the evolving biosphere is creating the possibilities into which it will flow. It's an unfolding. It's creating its own possibilities for future evolution. I think this is just stunning. Uh, and I also, it's true. And the same thing for the economy, uh, which is an expression of the same thing. Uh, a true story that I, I know, so it's fun. So, so there's a guy in Japan about 10 years ago, and he's living in a crowded apartment with lots and lots of books and a new kid. And the apartment's terribly crowded. And there's thousands of people in Tokyo living in crowded apartments with too many books. He, he's not thinking about that now. Right, he's thinking about, this apartment is so crowded, I'm going to take a photograph of all my books, and then I'm going to sell the books, and I'll be rid of the books, and I'll have my room in my apartment. Then he realizes his business opportunity. 
since there's lots of people in crowded apartments, I'll go to their apartments, I will use their cell phones, I will photograph their books, I'll sell their books, and I'll take 10% of the profit. He founded a new business. The adjacent possible for him was that cell phones had just come in, and there were crowded apartments, and he founded a new business, which was successful, it's not being copied all over Japan or the world. Do you think that anybody created iPhones so that they could be used to take photographs that this guy did? No, it was. But the creation of it enabled the possibility into which the biosphere into the economy flowed. Or my way of now saying it that is more suggestive is the economy creates the very adjacent possibilities into which it is sucked. Mm-hmm. Okay, sucking is more, of course, not true, but it's, it, it captures this feeling that. Well, I mean, it, it has that, it has that te- sense. It's what technology was. It's, it's Kevin Kelly's book. Right. I mean, it, it, you know, to talk about it as a sort of sucking action, though, does evoke that notion of a self-organizing dissipative structure like a whirlpool, right? And it also, this is completely off the page, but, you know, when people like Terrence McKenna talk about the strange attractor at the end of time, you know, that, that? He, he borrowed from complexity science and chaos theory to, to talk about what I think he intended to be a a sort of mathematical abstraction still, but which nonetheless raised all of these questions about, you know, the place into which the basin into which all of this evolutionary action is running, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of eschatological view. And when you, when you talk about, you know, the, the enablement of all of these new evolutionary possibilities, it reminds me of Teilhard de Chardin talking mm, about the how, point. Yeah, yeah. hyper collectivization leading to hyper personalization. You know, when you talk about there being just more stuff produced by a, a global c- c- civilization than by humans at the level of organization of a nation state or a, yeah. you know, a city state or and a the, tribal state. And the global them. economy is doing that. Yeah, yeah. And it seems as though uh, part of that is because. And I know you did a lot, some of your work at, at SFI on the diversification of cell types, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's like there, there's something about even if even if it's not anticipated, what what we see is the, there's a ratcheting process whereby as these new niches are created, they're created within systems. Like I tend to think of human civilization as its own entity. You know, not that mm-hmm. humans are sort of the, the, the cutting edge of things, but that mm-hmm. humans and all of our cultural ideas and, you know, co- you know, units of cultural transmission and all of our tools form the body of this bigger thing that is itself becoming more and more complex. Than the human civilization. Yeah. And, that, and, and it is. Right. And that it's mm-hmm. issuing civilization in its attempts to c- compute a survival strategy for the world is constantly raising the bar of its own challenge by disrupting itself internally Mm -hmm. through the, like this, this constant proliferation of new body parts. I don't know. So like there's a sense in which even though they're not anticipated, it seems as though life is, is in some sense employing this act of production of novelty in order to solve a problem that it's creating for itself. Yes. Yeah. So let's look at that. Yeah. Maybe we could parse what you said into separate, a couple of separate sure. things. Thing one is dissipated structures. Uh, actually, I've just talked about this literally yesterday. Uh, I can give you the PowerPoint if you want. The title of my talk was, you know, Schrodinger's What is Life, the book right over here. Mm-hmm. So the title of my talk that I, I just gave is, What is Life? Answering Schrodinger. And I, I think that in part I have. So let's just take that part. So Schrodinger is wondering... Uh, what's the source of the order in organisms? Then he says it can't be diffusion because there's not enough molecules in, in the hereditary a thousand atoms. So it has to be solids and it has to be aperiodic solids. And, and you know maybe that becomes DNA and RNA and the code and all that stuff. His second question, which you've already raised, is how come organisms are organized and this propagating organization for 3 billion years, 3.7 billion years, given the second law of thermodynamics? What's striking is that Schrodinger doesn't know the answer to his own question. I, I, I just talked about it. I, we can find it in here. I, I think there's a good chance that I do. Actually, I'm modestly confident about this. So so, so let's think about dissipated structures. So whirlpools and the giant red spot on, on Jupiter and Benar cells and uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and 
Those are all dissipative structures. They have the property that the flow of matter and energy through the system allows patterns to emerge. So your listeners may know about Bainar cells. So you take a pan of oil, you know, about half an inch deep, and you heat it from below gently. And uh, if the temperature gradient between bottom and top is low, it transports heat, as you were saying before. Michael, uh, just by the random motions of molecules, so it's a, a diffusive process. When you cross a threshold called the, the Rayleigh threshold of the temperature difference, it breaks into convective cells where there's columns of oil going up and columns going down. So this is the, er, er, the emergence of macroscopic order. And if you look at the top, you get hexagonal patterns or roll patterns, and so that's a dissipative structure. The, whether you get hexagonal patterns or roll patterns is determined by the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are the shape of the pan. Mm-hmm. And when you shape, change the shape of the pan, the shape of the patterns that you look down on it. Now, but they never become very complex. Uh, you, you, you don't get redwood trees out of in our cells. Life has. We started 3.7 billion years ago. Now there's redwood trees and, and you and me in Archaea. So there's, something, there's a lot missing. And one of the things is, and I, I, I gradually realize it, dissipative structures don't construct their own boundaries. It doesn't, the, the dissipative structure doesn't make it the pan that it's in. Okay? So can we go on on this for a while? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, this is actually, you know, I know that um, at your birthday celebration in, at SFI in August, Dave Deemer is one of the speakers. Yeah. And Deemer and Bruce Damer, who's been on this show, their work uh, and colleagues' work on. Mm-hmm. Emergence of protocells in the progenote and how the environment provided what eventually was internalized by these right. living systems as, right. as a cell membrane. But it didn't. Right. Their model shows the earliest forms of life not having its own membrane, the membrane being yes. provided by the environment. We're one sense of boundary conditions. Of cell. Yes. I actually love their scenario, and I, I write about it in this new book. But the other thing that caused me to, to write this new book was uh, a paper by Ma- Mile Monteville and Matteo Mosia. Mile will be coming, uh, called Constraint Closure. So this it's just an absolutely lovely idea. To brag for a moment, I got about two-thirds of the way there 20 years ago, uh, and then I entirely missed it, and they found it. It's gorgeous, and it's theirs. Damn it. <laughs> They're wonderful. So here's here's how here's the steps towards it. So this is sitting in... Uh, in reinvented no, it's sitting in investigations. My third book, so I, I, I got wondering about what's work. Um, so this takes a few minutes, but it's really interesting. So, uh, so if you ask a physicist what's work, he'll say force acting through a distance. So the hockey puck is accelerated, and the work done is you know the work done on the acceleration, and that's work. Atkins comes along in a book on the second law of thermodynamics about 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And he says, no, works more than that. It is the release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. Hmm. So now what does that mean? Uh, what's a degree of freedom if you're not a physicist? It's one of the possibilities. Okay, so, so the example that I can understand is a cannon and a cannonball. So the cannon, here's the cannon and here's the powder behind the cannon. The, can, the powder explodes. That's an exergonic reaction. It blasts the cannonball of the cannon. The cannon restricts the possible ways that the cannonball can move so that it blasts out the front of the cannon, right? That is the release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. So work, and Atkins is right, is the release of energy into a few degrees of freedom. And compare it to the case where the cannon's not there and the cannonball sitting on a steel plate and the powder is next to it and explodes, the cannonball won't move very much. Mm -hmm. Now, note something that is really obvious, but I'm being dumb, but it's right there. Uh, In the case that you blast the cannonball out the cannon, uh, a lot of work is done and less heat is produced than in the case where you have the cannonball sitting on the plate and the powder explodes. There's a hell of a lot of heat and the ball doesn't move, so not much work is done. So with more constraints on the release of energy, the cannon, right, more work is done and less entropy is produced. So just hang on to that. Then I, I felt very bad because I, I asked myself a, a new question. This is 2098 or something. Where the hell did the cannon come from? Yeah. Where did it come from? There weren't cannons around at the Big Bang. Well, okay. It took work to make the cannon. Somebody built a cannon. It worked to make a cannonball. It took work to put the cannonball inside the cannon and to stuff the powder in. 
So it took work to make the constraints on the release of energy, and it takes constraints on the release of energy to make work. Right. But that's not in the physics books. It's not. Go look. You will find. Well, this is this is. I admit, maybe this is a tangent. I, but I don't think it is. Maybe this it's is, in the physics. But I don't think so. This is a. Re, this is related to the question about this thing that's been bothering me since I started asking these kinds of questions about the origins of life, where, in a sense, generations, biological generations, mm-hmm. are the canon. You know, this it's the the, mm-hmm. the four dimension tunnel through which mm-hmm. this information is yeah. focused. That, you're right about that. It's a funny so, way of saying it. But yeah. you're exactly right about it. You're but so saying the, exactly correctly. Yeah, so these things are already, you know, in a sense we already have some form of individuality through which this information is, you know, tightly coupled in some directions and loosely coupled or not coupled at all in other directions, at least, you know, in any kind of meaningful way. Mm-hmm. But the current, or at least what was current when I was in school for this, sort of consensus around this is that there was like a a moment that life flipped on Mm -hmm. in the cosmos. Mm -hmm. And that always struck me as odd, because to me it seems as though life as a system, you know, a living organism as a system modeling its environment, in a sense, it's almost as though, you know, every organism is like a working hypothesis, about the universe, about what mm-hmm. the universe is. It is. Based on its local mm-hmm. sort of settings. It, it knows and creates its world. Right. Mm-hmm. So, but what that means is that this is a, this, it's a sort of a gathering concentration and arrangement of information mm-hmm. from the environment that in some, that in some sense, um, all of the functions that living systems serve in a sort of focused particular way started out unfocused and distributed. And so like with Deemer's work, this notion that the cell is an attempt to model the geographic enclosures created by like the pumice or whatever at the edge of the pond that these things were gathering in, that 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 there there's a way in which we can talk about this as a, a gradient where things move from distributed to centralized Mm -hmm. sort of Mm -hmm. and so in that sense like the constraints it's not like suddenly we have inheritance there's arguably ways that we can stretch the issue of variation and selection well into what we think of as abiotic or or prebiotic Mm -hmm. systems and there's been great work done on this in chemistry i imagine that this probably applies to issues of quantum what is versus what is merely possible that things are being selected out of out of a landscape of possibility and we may be getting ahead and sort of or foreshadowing the questions i have for you about your work with quantum mechanics but it, it seems as though there had to have always been some constraint i've heard you argue very compellingly that there's that there is there's like a line where a certain kind of thinking works before life but it doesn't work for life. And but yet, the, and yet it maybe, seems as I though... Mean, but be, before yeah. we go, that's all neat stuff. And uh, I'm struggling with that too, but I want to get us to constraint closure. Yeah. This idea of yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so so we're, we're at this this spark that it took work to make the canon. The canon is a boundary condition, right? It's a constraint on the release of energy that is explicitly in Newtonian terms, of boundary conditions. It's like, the, it's like the edge of the billiard table, yes? Mm-hmm. So boundary conditions and constraints, in this sense, are exactly the same thing. So it takes boundary conditions or constraints on the release of energy to get work. No constraints, no work. And it often takes work to make constraints. I'm not sure that it always does, but it certainly often does. Okay, so let's just take make it stronger. No constraints, no work, no work, no constraints. Where we're going to go to is Mile, Bonneville, and Matteo Mosio realization that organisms construct their own boundary conditions. But but I want to get there. Okay, so let's call this the constraint work cycle. Uh, so I got a little further in, uh, I guess it's in reinventing the sacred or it's an investigation. So let's talk about macroscopic work. So just take an automobile. The gas explodes in the, in the base of the cylinder and the piston goes out and it makes the camshafts go around and it makes the wheels turn. <laughs> That's linking a bunch of spontaneous and non-spontaneous processes, and the car goes. So let's just call that macroscopic work. But 
Notice that cars don't construct their own boundary conditions. They don't construct their own engines. They don't assemble engines. Neither do trucks, uh, neither do television sets. So now I want to get to constraint closure. So uh, let me say it abstractly because it's easier to see in the abstract case. So I've got a set of non-equilibrium processes. Let me just number them. Process one, process two, and process three. Process one, it's non-equilibrium. It's some flow of something. It might be a chemical reaction. To do work has to be constrained. So let the constraint on process one be constraint A. So there's three processes and three constraints. Process one, two, and three, and three constraints A, B, and C. And the neat idea that these two guys had is the set of processes construct the same constraints. They construct the constraints on the reserve energy by which they do work to construct the same constraints. That's constraint closure. It's hard to get until you get it. You say, oh, good grief. Why didn't I think of that? And I'm really amused and pissed at myself that I didn't think of it because I realized in the example that I gave years ago, and you can get to this back, if you've got work that is, if, you've done, if the system does thermodynamic work, that work could construct something that could be used as a constraint, right? So here's an example we know. Machine tools uh, construct cylinders, but cylinders can be used in constraints and engines. So of course, work construct constraints. Yes? Huh. The big thing that Mile and, and Mateo realized is that a system constructs its own constraints. So I've got three non-equilibrium processes, one, two, three. I've got three constraints. So to be concrete, one realization is process one is constrained by A, but it produces B. Process two is constrained by B, but it produces C. Process three is produced, constrained by C, but it produces A. Can you see it now? I mean, that's kind of a, an autocatalytic set. It's exactly an autocatalytic yeah. set. Okay. So that's why I'm really annoyed at myself and amused because <laughs> I should have found it. I've been thinking about autocatalytic since 1971. So but, but you have the idea of constraint. So a constraint closed system is just remarkable. It literally builds the constraints on the release of energy by which it does work to construct its own constraints. These guys thought of it. I think they have found maybe either A, certainly A, maybe the central idea of organization in organisms, and you won't find it in the molecular biology texts. They don't have the idea. I know I'm, I'm a molecular biologist by advocation. <laughs> uh, so so I've got this idea about autocatalytic sets that actually I did come up with in 1971. By the way, in a funny way, um, people talk about the fact that often advances in science comes from throwing away something which you assume has to be true. In 71, everybody is, we knew DNA and RNA and template replication, so everybody assumed that life had to be based on template replicating RNA. It's still the dominant view in the United States. It's called the RNA world, and it might be right. I got where I got by in a really funny step. I said, what if the constants of nature were a little different? So you could get chemistry, but you couldn't make nitrogen. So you couldn't make DNA. But you could make complex molecules in this alternate set of constants, and you could have chemical reactions. And I literally what I thought was, life's gotta be much more general than template replicating DNA and RNA. It must be based on a bunch of molecules that can undergo reactions, and the molecules catalyze the reactions by which they're formed. So that's a collectively autocatalytic set. And in, I, I published it in 71. Then, then I proved theorems. I don't prove many theorems, but I actually prove the theorems uh, in 84, that's why I'm here in Santa Fe, that if you have a complicated enough chemical reaction mixture, it will spontaneously form a collectively autocatalytic set. So that's all published. It's all over the place. I did make the mistake. John Horgan was interviewing me at some point, uh, and I, I think I was a little drunk after this. And he said, well, Dr. Kaufman, do you think your theory is plausible? And I said, oh, I think it's right. And John, of course, published Scientific American, and I've been rasped quite a bit about it. So where we are now, just to talk about that part for a moment, is that people have made collectively autocatalytic sets of DNA, autocatalytic sets of RNA. Most importantly, they've made autocatalytic sets of proteins. So Godin Ashkenazi in the Ben-Gurion has nine peptides that mutually catalyze one another's formation. And whatever else your listeners might think, this means the following thing. You could get molecular reproductions with proteins alone, Therefore, it's absolutely certain you don't need DNA and RNA to get molecular reproduction. That's done. 
it's a different issue whether you can have life like we know it based on that. And a bunch of us are trying to make collectively autocatalytic of peptides and RNA and stuff, but that's true. And you can also have collectively autocatalytic sets. Nobody's gotten them to emerge spontaneously in a complex reaction mixture. We've gotten close. Niles Lehman's made them happen with libraries of, of uh, 15 ribozymes that are cleaved, and it's a wonderful experiments. So the next step, so take a collectively autocatalytic set of peptides, and Mile and Matteo realized this, and, and uh, I, I guess I sort of did too, but let's just put it together. An enzyme is a boundary condition. Well, what in the world does that mean? Well, here's the enzyme, and it's going to bind two substrates. Call them substrates A and B. A and B are floating around in the cell, and they have three-dimensional degrees of freedom. Uh, if they bind to the enzyme, they're hooked right next to one another. They've only got, at most, one-dimensional degree of freedom. So you've lowered the activation barrier for the reaction. But lowering the reactivation, activation barrier for reaction means that energy can be released much more probably in a specific direction, right, to make the AB compound. So enzymes are literally boundary conditions quite in the same way as the boundary of the table is, okay? Uh, okay, so now we have this idea of constraint closure. I truly think it's brilliant. I think it's, it, it unleashes everything. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to Schrodinger. So Schrodinger is wondering, now I'm pretty persuaded of this, I did just talk about it yesterday. Um, so there's some funny things going on. Schroeder uses the wonderful phrase, we can look it up in the book. He says, there's going to be an aperiodic crystal that contains, he uses this wonderful imagery, he says a periodic crystal would be like wallpaper with the same flower repeating off to infinity. It'd be dull. Literally, he says the word dull. Then he says, uh, the aperiodic crystal in organisms is going to be like a Raphael tapestry somehow information rich and that it will contain a code script that somehow forms the adult he doesn't know how so then he was worried about you know the second law of thermodynamics well so we all know that within 15 years after this we've uncovered the structure of dna and the code and all of that and, and then we get molecular biology in the code okay so what's the answer to schrodinger's second question well we've got in about two steps, I think we've got it. And I've only realized that the past couple of months, uh, it's actually pretty easy. So in physics, just take Newton. You've got the differential equation, three laws of motion and universal gravitation. Then Newton says, but we need initial and boundary conditions. But Newton doesn't tell you what the boundary conditions are. You can stick in any boundary conditions you want. To say it more radically, we can freely choose the boundary conditions. In my talk yesterday, I used an example that I lived a couple of months ago. Kate and I went with her kids and grandkids to play peewee golf. At the peewee golf course had 18 holes. There were just a bunch of six by six bore, you know, timbers arranged in different ways on the floor. And jutting out into the pathways created by the timbers were little thing, little wood pieces that came out at funny angles. Well, as you change the angles of those things, you change the way the ball bounces, right? Uh, so I'm going to make a move. So let me define the the face space of the billiard balls on the table. If I know the billiard, if I know the, the shape of the table, I know all possible positions and momentum of the balls. That set of all possible positions and momentum of the balls is the face space of the system. If I change the shape of the table, I've changed the face space, right? Okay, same thing for the billiard for the ball rolling on the floor. If I change the angles of these little things sticking out. I've changed the face space of the system. I've changed the possible trajectories. I've changed all possible positions and momenta. But I can change them freely. Newton doesn't say what they are. So I'm going to make an interpretation of what information is. We know Shannon. We'll get to Shannon in a minute. And it takes a couple of steps to say this clearly. Shannon information requires that the message string that comes down the channel could have been different. That is, if you send down one, 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 one down the channel, it contains no information unless some of the ones could have been zeros. They, it must counterfactually be the case that they could have been otherwise. Okay, uh, and we'll see that in a moment. But Shannon defines the entropy of the source. If there's only one message, the entropy of the source is zero, and it carries no information. So it's going to tie right into Shannon in, in an okay way, I think. This is my first try at doing this in the last couple of weeks. Same thing for these little boards jutting out. They carry information, 
but that requires that they could have been different, which is captured and we can rearrange the board, the little timbers, any way we want, but it's we doing it, okay? So then they contain information. Okay, so now we've got these, and we've got constraint closure from M&M, and we're trying to answer Schrodinger. So Schrodinger is worried, how come organisms are quite stable displaced from equilibrium, but they just don't go off to the entropic death? How come they could delay, they delay, literally says, how come they could delay uh, return to equilibrium, which is death? And of course, part of it is that we eat food. And Schrodinger then says, we, 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 we suck in order from the environment. That's fine. That gets you to dissipative structures, but it doesn't get you to organisms. Okay, it gets you to it gets you to the red spot on Jupiter. People didn't know about dissipative structures when Schrodinger what wrote. So let's see if I can say the rest of this. Let's jump to encoded protein synthesis. We don't have an account yet for the in the thinking about the origin of life. There's lots of pictures about getting autocatalytic sets. There's dreams of taking RNA molecules and get them to copy themselves. That's the RNA world. How to get to encoded protein synthesis, namely the evolution of the code, is a big mystery. Let's just jump over it. Uh, I want now to give pause and give credit to Paul Davies and Sarah Walker in an article of theirs in 2013. They point out that uh, encoded protein synthesis realizes von Neumann's universal constructor. Do you know about this? It's been a while. It's, it's a really neat idea. Yeah, go well, on. you know, von, von Neumann. So von Neumann is coming along, I guess this is in the 50s, and he's, he's inspired by the idea that he was part of a universal computer and he wants to make a system that can reproduce itself. So what he, this is not an autocatalytic set, pause. The autocatalytic set makes only itself. It can't make everything. Right. Right. Uh, the gonin set can make the nine peptides, but it can't make an elephant. Although the autocatalytic set could be a pre-adaptation. To make an elephant. That yeah. makes it, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. It, like it, Autocatalytic the, sets can evolve. Well, it's like all it takes is, and this is the thing, it's like much like the limb, like all it takes is being washed up or whatever, into a new context, yeah, right. And theorem: autocatalytic sets can evolve without any DNA and template replicating DNA. <clears throat> they may not be able to evolve very well, but at least they can evolve some. Anyway, so here's von Neumann's idea. Uh, then we'll come back to Schrodinger. Uh, I think I could say this straight. So von Neumann invents uh, basically a universal constructor, UC. Paul Davis and Ed Sarah Walker say, and it can build anything. Therefore, it can build itself. But you have to stick instructions in it so that it builds itself and not a steamship or, a, you know, a, a cable. And von Neumann realizes something absolutely brilliant that he was right about uh, before DNA was discovered. He says what you have to do is put some instructions inside of this universal constructor so that it can read the instructions and construct itself. So you imagine some girders bolted together in some way that somehow is the instructions. And von Neumann realizes something that's not in the autocatalytic set yet. He realizes you have to use this beam system in two ways. You have to read it to instruct the universal constructor what to build. Then you have to use, you have to just copy, blindly copy the instructions and stick a copy in the newly created thing. And now you've got a self-reproducing machine. So von Neumann largely got himself to what DNA does, okay, 20 years later. And that's absolutely brilliant. And that is not in a collectively autocatalytic set yet. So we're, this is a side trip from trying to answer Schrodinger. And uh, Paul Davis and Sarah Walker are absolutely right, and I have ignored it until I read them two weeks ago, that they point out correctly that once you've got the DNA RNA protein translation system in a ribosome, that is a universal constructor for any possible polypeptide made out of the standard 20 amino acids. That's just gorgeous. They're right. And we haven't gotten that into the story yet. It will fit into what I want to say about Schrodinger. So let's let's make the step with von Neumann and, and Paul and Sarah. That's really important. We, we've really got to think more about the evolution of the code, which people are doing. Peter Wills, a friend in New Zealand, has been thinking about it for years. Somehow, we're, as far as I know, we're not all talking to one another. We need to. So good. So now let's get back to Schrodinger. So let's just take uh, encoded protein synthesis given. An enormous step. But now... Encoded protein synthesis means that, think of the, the RNA and the proteins made as themselves boundary conditions, as I just said. So we've now got a universal constructor for new boundary conditions, right? So let's look at how this happens. So let's just take evolution. 
well, okay, I get a random mutation in the DNA that's a quantum event that's random, and it changes an A to a C, or an A to a T, or a C to a G, okay? Well, now the system can make a new protein. That's a new boundary condition. That's happening all the time in evolution. I'll come back to that in a little bit, but those are new boundary conditions. But, but now inside of cells are genetic regulatory networks in which genes turn one another on and off. Uh, and so you can have multiple cell types, and the different cell types are making different pattern, different sets of RNA and proteins. Yeah, right? Absolutely nailed. So this is part of something that actually I had a, a fair amount to do with when I invented random Boolean nets in, uh, I don't know, I was 24, because I wanted to know what big networks of genes would do. And it turns out they can be ordered, chaotic, or critical. Uh, and it now turns out that cells are critical with pretty good evidence. Uh, Talk about criticality a little bit, because this is yeah, the first time this has ever come yeah, up on the I'll, show. Yeah, I'll get to it in a minute. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, anyway, the question is, how come we have about 300 different cell types? Jacques Cobb and Minot had pointed out that you could take two genes and turn one another off. I repress you, you repress me. So we could have mic off, stew on, stew off, mic on. So that's two steady states of a little circuit. And... I did invent random Boolean nets. I didn't know enough not to. And it turns out that they have the number of alternative stable patterns of gene activity out of th with thousands of genes, and we have 23,000 genes, scales as the square root of the number of genes. So if, there's 23, if it's 100,000 genes, there's about 300 alternative patterns. It turns out it predicts the number of cell types in organisms remarkably well. And we've just published a paper re-looking at something I did in 69, the number of cell types in an organism scales is roughly the square root of the number of genes. Mm. And we've just republished that. The scaling law now is, the data is, the scaling is 0.88, not, my, the theory that I developed would have said the scaling law is 0.62 or something like that. But it predicts a power law scaling. No other theory does that. That says that ensemble theories might be useful. Wait a minute, the 0.88 you said yeah. is where it is now? Uh -huh. That's very similar to Jeff West's uh, yeah, yeah, power yeah. law for cities. Yeah, yeah, and, that's interesting. And, and yeah, the, that's the right. number of yeah, yeah, yeah. jobs and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I really want to talk to Jeff West about this stuff. I hope I can at some point. Anyway, this means the following. Different cell types in you are making different RNA and proteins. The RNA and proteins are literally boundary conditions. Uh, just like the peewee golf course, if you change the boundary conditions, you change the phase space that the system is in, and that's what's happening in organisms. So your liver cells are in a different phase space than your kidney cells because they're making different proteins. So we've got basically the theory for, roughly, how many alternative patterns there are. So now we've got information. Well, I'm going to get to information in a moment, but, but the boundary condition could have been different. The timber could have been in a different position is the same as the cell could make this protein or could make that protein. It's making different boundary conditions. Okay? So now let me try to come back to Schrodinger with some Shannon. So now we have Shannon information theory, which wasn't around when Schrodinger did it. And we get really puzzled about, so what the hell is information? And it gets used for all kinds of things. So let's get Shannon for a moment. So Shannon says he's got a source, and uh, you've got a bit string's length n, n is say 10, so there's 1,024 possible messages, and the messages occur with different copy numbers in the source, so you can compute the entropy of the source. It's it's some p log p for the you know the, the number of different possibilities. That's the entropy of the source. Then you send a message down the channel and you receive it at the receiver. It's a somewhat noisy channel, and information has been transmitted down the channel. If the receiver is less uncertain about what the message will be now that he's received it, than if we just knew the entropy of the source. So it's a reduction of entropy, right? So for Shannon, entropy is fundamentally uncertainty. Paul Davis makes this point also in, uh, oh, in The Hard Problem of Life, in mm. one of these books. Uh, so Paul and, 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 and Sarah uh, don't know where, it, they don't know how information calls the shots. And they, they talk about it. I think I know one interpretation of information that calls the shots, and I'm anxious to see what Paul and Sarah will say. Maybe they'll say I'm just being silly. I, I hope not. And it's to say that boundary conditions that could have been different constitute information in one sense of information. So it's going to, of course, call the shots because they're boundary conditions. So let's turn to information. Um, information 
a system has received information if there's less uncertainty about the outcome, right? Okay, so I, I love these images. So picture the cannon with the cannonball. Uh, the cannon shaped like a tuba, okay? I, I don't know why I like this, but it's cute. Or the cannonball lying on a flat sheet of, of steel. Mm -hmm. And now let's consider what happens. You explode the powder, and the cannonball blasts out the real cannon. There is a lot of work done and not too much entropy produced compared to the tuba, okay, where you're less certain about where the ball will go, so there's more uncertainty about where the ball will go, and also more heat is produced and less work is done. Now take the flat plate. You're really uncertain where the ball is going to go, and a lot of heat is produced and not much work is done. So I want to make the following move. It seems perfectly okay to me. The more constraints there are on the release of energy, a la Atkins, the more work is done and the less entropy is produced. But simultaneously, the more constraints there are on the release of energy, the more informed or, or certain we are of the outcome of the process. The cannonball goes that way, not any old way. See it? Mm -hmm. It's... So I'm going to tie one sense of information to the certainty about the outcome or how the outcome is less uncertain in the case of the cannon than in the tuba cannon. And that in turn is less uncertain. The outcome is less uncertain in the case of the steel plate. And I think it's completely, there's nothing about plates that matters. It's for any release of energy in any non-equilibrium process. So one interpretation of information that could have been different, and it could have, take the different cell types, is information is precisely the release of energy into fewer degrees of freedom. The more the degrees of freedom in which energy, the more constrained the release of energy is, the more work's done, the less entropy is produced, and the more informed the process is, the more constrained it is. But, I mean, this seems... Uh, it's, almost, it's almost trivial. Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> it, again, like this, this notion that it's... it's a, you get into this, this thing, I feel like a lot of people get hung up on this notion when we talk about order from chaos uh -huh. that it's we're talking about a local rather than a global thing right mm -hmm. so it's like in the case of your example you know from the sort of cosmic perspective it's not clear to me i mean it is it's clear locally that a canon is giving you you know you have you have more information given, like a redu reduced uncertainty regarding where the ball is going to go mm -hmm. within that sort of thing. Yeah, you know. But but again, like maybe we draw uh, the boundaries on this system much much wider. At which point, zoom out far enough, then the differences between those situations become trivial. Sure. Right. But, but, but there's something that I think you're also pointing at, which is for sure correct. Uh, it's certainly the case that in the canon. Uh, heat is created, so the entropy of the universe goes up. Right. It does. Right. You're still producing entropy. But the cannon, shooting the cannonball, is producing less entropy than the case of the cannonball sitting on the flat steel plate. All these cases are producing entropy, but the cannon produces, does more work, is more informed, and produces less entropy than the cannonball on the flat steel plate, which is more entropy, less work, more entropy, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're now in a position to answer Schrodinger. Uh, so the organism achieves constraint closure. The constraints on the release of energy, releases energy into a few degrees of freedom, therefore does more work and produces less entropy and is more informed because the energy is released into fewer degrees of freedom. And now the things are self-reproducing things. It's an autocratic set in a liposome, a la Daimler and Deemer. And now we've got a protocell, and that's how to exactly answer uh, Schrodinger, I think. The system stays displaced from equilibrium with substantial order that produces some entropy, but not a hell of a lot compared to a completely disordered thing. I think that answers Schrodinger. And the, the, the steps and the answers are, Newton leaves free what the boundary conditions are. The boundary conditions call the shots. I hope this is an answer to Sarah Walker and Paul Davis, giving them the freedom to tell me that I'm entirely wrong. They haven't heard the ideas yet, but I think I'm right. I think it's easy. And so now I've got boundary conditions that could be different. Change the boundary conditions. You change the face space of the systems. In an autocatalytic set, the proteins are boundary conditions, and they change the face space, and they could have been different, so they carry information. I'll come back to that and say it again in a sec. 
so that, that, that answers how an organism stays displaced from equilibrium, but stays pretty ordered. So I think I've answered Schrodinger. And that's why it's an adjacent possible rather than a circumjacent possible. Yes. Because there are some constraints. It's yes. not just sure. everything Absolutely. anywhere. Yeah. So yeah. a couple points. In, in, in Shannon's definition of information, the information you've received is the reduction in entropy compared to the source. Okay. Suppose there's only one message that can come out of the source. Then sum of p log p is zero. There's only one message. It couldn't have been different. So there's no information transmitted. I think that's exactly the same thing as saying you could have placed the timbers in different positions in, in the peewee golf course. And if they could have been different, there's information that, that is in them. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's going on. So now there's a huge thing beyond this. The universe is, 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 uh, non ergodic above the level of atoms. I actually think this is so simple, but so profound, and we haven't paid attention to it. So has the universe made all possible 120 stable atoms? Yeah, they're all around. Nucleosynthesis and the stars and stuff. You know, hydrogen, helium, lithium, carbon, radium, uranium, transuranium elements. Now ask, has the universe made all possible proteins length 200? Well, the answer is no then it's a real simple calculation. So there's 20 kinds of amino acids. There are to make the 20. A protein length 200. There's 20 possibilities for each point. So there's 20 to the 200th. Well, 20 to the 200th is about 10 to the 260th. That's a really big number. The number of particles in the universe is 10 to the 80th, roughly. The universe is 14 billion years old, which is something like 10 to the 17 seconds, because I figured it out before. <laughs> so if the 10 to the 80th particles were doing nothing, oh, the fastest time scale in the universe is the Planck time scale, which is 10 to the minus 43rd. So if the universe were doing nothing but making proteins length 200, you can ask how long would it take to make all possible proteins length 200? And the answer is astonishing. It would take the current age of the universe raised uh, you know, times 10 to the to the 37th power. That means that's to make all possible proteins once. And you want to make it worse, make the proteins length 1,000. Okay? That means the universe will not create all possible complex things. Well, I mean, well, hold on now, because I feel like this is the kind of thing that comes up a lot in talks about origins of life. You know, especially the, the sort of like foolish creationist argument you know, God did it. Yeah, that, that there's no way that we've had time enough for this. But, uh-huh. I mean, we're not starting from a serial dial going through all of these things one after the other, every plank time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not happening in itself. Like, you, you know, this, this example of the mini golf course, mm-hmm. like you said, we, like you just spent the last half hour talking about, there are constraints to this. Mm-hmm. And... Also, I don't know what I don't know what difference it makes in this, but you know, listening to you talk about this, the di- you know when it comes to like niche creation and general like r- relationships uh, among living organisms, mm-hmm. the mini golf example would be you know more accurately one in which the ball is constantly changing the shape of the course itself, yeah. right? Sure. So, mm-hmm. so I mean, it's you know one of the things I liked about you know Deemer's abiogenesis is that first of all unlike that example you know unlike the this notion of like serial and iterative exploration we're talking about massive parallel computation Absolutely. Mm-hmm. we are you know and then sure. we're talking about a, it not not as much in his sort of early example but like Who's in general that? in, in deemers mm-hmm. in, you know protocells mm-hmm. uh each you mean with their 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 their, their scenario for their yeah their their scenario their, involves the little pool yeah involves mm-hmm. sort of you know an unthinkably large number of these me- parallel uh, chemical experiments mm-hmm. being run mm-hmm. you know then you they're or, making protocells yeah or by the way and, uh let me just sort of throw yeah. We're all talking to one another. David, uh, D- Dave Deemer uh, and Bruce Deemer are picturing these these liposomes, which have some mixture of polymers that undergo the plastine reaction. I- I'm kind of pleased because I knew about the plastine reaction in '93 because mm-hmm. I was wondering if you could get life with autocatalytic sets of proteins. So the plastine reaction is you take a bunch of peptides. People did this in 32, and you put an enzyme in that breaks peptides down. Uh, then if you concentrate the, the system by taking out water, the peptides glue together and make larger peptides. And the reason is that water is a leaving group in the reaction. If you take the product away, because you dehydrate it, they make big peptides again. 
So people were doing this in 1932 in the Plasteen reaction. People thought maybe genes were this. So mm. uh, Damer and Deemer make use of the Plasteen reaction in their in their right, in their their scenario. Uh, that may be a perfectly dandy condition to get the emergence of collectively autocatalyzed sets of peptides or RNA or both. So the two stories tie together quite nicely. It's theory right now, but it's not that far from an experiment. But anyway, I interrupted you. Oh, well, you know, just that, you know, when we're talking about selecting for the improbable, first of all, there's a couple of things and maybe, maybe I'm forcing a transition into this prematurely, but you know, like, Around the time I was discovering your stuff, I was also reading John Joe McFadden at University of Surrey. He wrote a book called Quantum Evolution, and he's he's been one of the the sort of more persistent voices in the quantum biology conversation. And he proposed in that book the possibility that we are able to get around the seeming improbability of some of these chemical outputs, mm -hmm. these these structures by invoking a, a massive parallelism in quantum computation and that, you know, that, that something like the first self-replicating mm. molecule may have existed in a superposition of possible chemical states until, you know, until quote unquote, it's not like a linear time thing, mm -hmm. but that one of those, one of those states is the state that collapses the wave function. And so you immediately get, this seemingly hugely improbable outcome. Could you could you put me a link to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quantum evolution by Mc, John Joe McFadden. Okay. Um, where he's where he's in Surrey. Surrey, yeah. And I don't know. You know, it's it's been years. So, since so I read the, that book. is this the idea? You have all of these uh, super, quantum superposition, uh, simultaneously quantum superposition of let's say RNA sequences like two hundred. Hmm. Only one or a few of these possible sequences have the property that they can replicate themselves. Somehow the capacity to replicate itself collapses the wave function and that's the one that emerges mm -hmm. okay, into reality by, by quantum measurement somehow or decoherence or something like that. Well, that's neat. It sounds conceivable. Well, I mean, and so mm -hmm. similar to that is, again, this notion that since we're talking about a sort of ratcheting opening of the adjacent possible through this mm. metabol biospheric metabolism or whatever you would care to call it, it takes less time in the same way that you're, you know, you're talking about this sort of work constraint, mm -hmm. uh, chicken and egg thing. Yeah. It takes less time to evolve human beings who will, for the hell of it, synthesize all possible 200 length polypeptides then it would take to just roll through them one after the other so i'm, I'm getting lost okay so, but, but so hang on, hang yeah on. sorry i also disagree okay so yeah so so, here's, leave out for the moment the interesting idea that mcfadden has okay treat these as classical objects yeah my, my, i think my argument is just obviously right it would take at the planck time scale it would take Got zillions of times the history of the universe to make all possible polypeptides like 200 once. We cannot go out and synthesize. We can, we can make any one we want now. Actually, I made the first library doing that. Mark Bollaby and I made the first libraries of random DNA, RNA, and proteins in 1985, on which I got a patent. Well, Mark and I got a patent because I wanted to make drugs and vaccines. So you can do it. Mm -hmm. But can't make all of them. Mm -hmm. Another funny thought, though, is McFadden had this idea. Gabor Bate is a colleague of mine. Uh, he's in Budapest, being we right now about the attacks on science. And Gabor gave a talk at a meeting we had at CERN in 2013 using something we call the poise problem that we can talk about. Yeah, uh, to, this to, is something I'm curious about. To realize that if you can go from quantum to classical, which I think you can, that's decoherent. So you can go to almost classical, FAPP, for all practical purposes, and you can go back and forth. In the quantum state, you could imagine that uh, it's sort of like McFadden, that a whole variety of possible reactions could happen at once. And then if somehow you had a way of making that thing measure itself in, in some wacky way, so it becomes actual, maybe something cool could happen. I, I don't know. It's, it sounds like an interesting thing to play with. My own ideas about this, which I've had since 71, are completely classical. It's just that if you have a mixture of, say, peptides, they will crystallize an autocatalytic set, but that's all totally classical so far. So anyway, where were we? I don't know, but I mean, I guess to make sure we don't get lost in the weeds, <laughs> yeah. you know, my question, 
you've done work in Origins of Life. You've done work in quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. Do you regard the quantum as somehow a missing piece to our understanding of the phenomena that we observe in evolution? Or do you think that, like McFadden, I don't know, based on this stuff with Deemer's work, etc., that we need to invoke quantum mechanics in order to explain the seemingly improbable order that we observe. Uh, but a lot of people do still still believe this. Whereas I'm, I'm more of the persuasion that evolutionary process, like you're talking about the early, the early days of SFI, you're looking for these general underlying yeah. patterns. And it seems to me as though evolutionary dynamics may actually be more like it's applicable to the quantum realm rather than the quantum realm being necessary to explain what we're observing in biological order. But I mean, wh what are your thoughts Lots on this? Get, but I better say the following. Yeah. I'm not a physicist. I, <laughs> I, I'm a philosopher doctor who went off into theoretical biology because I invented random Boolean nets when I was 24 to think about cell. And yet you have patents on I do. stuff that leans on this stuff. You so. are, we have patents on the poison realm. Yeah. So Gabor Bate, Samuel Niren and I, Basically, they were invented or discovered about eight years ago. We could jump to that if you want to, but 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 uh, in a non-mystical way, let's just look at the following thing. Now we've got DNA, and we've got a fruit fly. So so it's really true that a quantum random event can cause a mutation, right? So now the fly makes a new protein. Now think of the, the DNA molecule protein as classical for the moment, and the fly is certainly classical. So suppose the mutation causes the eye of fruit fly to turn white. There's really a mutation that does it. It's a recessive called white. But let's imagine that it's dominant, which it's not, doesn't matter. And let's imagine that the white-eyed flies is fitter in its environment than the red-eyed flies. So we pay, come back 40 years later, and there's a hell of a lot of white-eyed flies all over the world. Which means that that DNA molecule that happened in that one fly, because it's dominant, is now millions and millions of copies of that DNA sequence in the universe, right? But most complex things will not come to exist in the universe. But there's this DNA molecule that does exist. Why? It's because the white-eyed fly was fitter than the red-eyed fly. Now let's ask if we can explain this by quantum mechanics alone. Well, obviously not. Can we explain it by classical physics alone? Well, no, because it depends upon the white-eyed fly being fitter than the other flies. And that's not classical physics, that's Darwin and natural selection. Agreed? For new functionalities, which we cannot restate by the screwdriver argument. Okay? It's neither quantum mechanics alone. Let's come back to your quantum mechanics thing. There's very neat, neat puzzles there. It's neither quantum mechanics alone, nor quantum mechanics plus classical physics alone. That will give you the mutated DNA. Right? But it won't give you the fact that there's zillions of copies of that DNA molecule all over Nebraska 20 years later. Neither quantum mechanics alone, nor classical mechanics alone, classical physics alone, nor the union of them, well, let's just call it quantum cum classical, will explain the existence in the universe 14 billion years later of this wacky DNA molecule. Nothing explains it, because there's no law that entails the evolution of the biosphere, so there's no law whatsoever for the becoming of this thing that exists in the universe. It's constrained by physics, but it's not explained by physics. Okay, so this this is seemingly parallel to Lorenz and chaos theory. You know, Lorenz insisting that chaotic systems are still deterministic and that our our inability to predict them is due to basically like a, a measurement error. So this gets so to the hang on. Yeah. You're right, but you're wrong. Okay. So let me say why. So let's take Lorentz and chaotic attractors. In a chaotic attractor, one pre-states the phase space. Mm -hmm. And you've got to create a chaotic attractor in that phase space, Le Poincaré realized in 1898, where it's true that infinitesimally close uh, initial states can diverge far apart. They have positive Lyapunov exponents, right? But they're in a predefined phase space. It might be three. It has to be three-dimensional. Might be seven-dimensional. What's going on in evolution is that the phase space itself is changing, mm -hmm. just like rearranging the, you know, the, with the the, the Pee Wee golf course. Yeah. So, it's it's much more grand or more confusing than deterministic chaos. We, we've mastered deterministic chaos. 
This is something else. This is that evolution is creating its own face space. And more than that, to come back to Schrodinger and beyond, the evolution of organisms keeps us opening up new possibles. Right? So now we've got archaea, and we've got bacteria, and we've got redwood trees, and sea urchins, and worms living under rocks. That's because living systems constructing their own boundary conditions, in part by the universal construct called the ribosome, but even without it to some extent, is creating the own adjacent, its own adjacent possible into which it can become. So the white-eyed fly wins, and now we've got that DNA molecule, and it can be mutated in some wacky further way, and it becomes T-Rex after you know, a couple steps. So I've got this serious hunch that there is a fourth law of thermodynamics, for, at least for biospheres, that they construct and are sucked into their own ever-expanding adjacent possible. But it can't be ever expanding. That's wrong because there's huge extinction events like the Permian and 94% of all species go extinct. So I think it's got to be a tendency. Mm -hmm. The adjacent possible tends to grow. And tendency is interesting. And it may be right too, Michael, because think of so the, the, the second law of thermodynamics is a tendency for entropy to increase. And it's important to say why it's a tendency and the answer is the ergodic hypothesis. So pause over this. So you've, you've got the uh, n particles in this in in the bo in the leader box. So everybody knows you can specify the position of a particle at, uh, with three numbers and the momentum with three numbers. So you've got a six n dimensional. You've got n particles. It's a six n dimensional phase space. Standard statistical mechanics. Then you divide it up into a lot of tiny six n dimensional boxes that fill up the whole phase space. That's a microstate. And then you define a macrostate as some collection of microstates, anything. Then you define the entropy of a macrostate as the logarithm of the number of microstates in that macrostate. Then uh, Boltzmann did something really beautiful. He said, I can't integrate the Newton's laws, you know, for 10 to the 23rd particles. Screw it. He didn't say screw it. He's German. He's Austrian. Uh, I'm going to give up integrating Newton's equations. Giuseppe Longo told me about it. The ergodic hypothesis just says the following. It's really interesting. He says, the system will spend equal time in equal volumes of phase space over the long haul. That's the ergodic hypothesis. That gives up integrating Newton's equations. It just says it spent equal times in equal volumes. Therefore, you will spend more times in macrostates with more microstates than in mm. macrostates with fewer microstates. Therefore, the system will tend to be in states with a lot of microstates. And the equilibrium microstate has an awful lot of micro, macrostate, has an awful lot of microstates. So the system will tend to flow to the equilibrium state. But of course, it could go back the other way, right? So the second law is the tendency, because we haven't integrated Newton's equations. In some way that I think is right, but I can't formulate yet, maybe no, and it may be wrong, somehow, Biospheres evolve into an ever-growing adjacent possible for a different reason, because they can. So let me try to be explicit about can. In Boltzmann's case, it's, it's deterministic, it's Newton, and he gives up integrating the equations. But in evolution, with the wide-eyed fly, there really is can. And the reason it's can is because quantum mechanics uh, is not deterministic. There's no determinism, you know, it's just, a, it's just a quantum jump when you get the mutation from C to G. This is the stuff that, that Einstein couldn't stand. It just happens, like radio it just happens. As far as you know, there's nothing causal. And the quantum people and quantum mechanics will say, if it's not forbidden, it can happen, and it will. That's how the mutation happens. It's a can. It can become one of its possibilities, because measurement will collapse to, you know, one of the quantum possibilities. You take the amplitudes, square the amplitudes, and that's the probability by by uh, the Born rule that that's the outcome of measurement, okay? That means that getting that mutant DNA is not a deterministic thing, it's just, it can happen. Then we've got, let's make ontogeny deterministic, so you get the wide-eyed fly. But then you've got the evolution of the wide-eyed fly, and Longo, Kaufman, and Motorville come back in 2010 and say, but there's no law for the evolution of the biosphere because you can't write down the phase space, so you can't like, write down laws of motion. The classical world of physics is, is bounded on one side by quantum mechanics, which is, in that sense, 
not deterministic, in one sense it's lawless, and the evolution of the biosphere is not held by entailing law. So the biosphere, I think, becomes into an adjacent possible because it can. It's really weird. It's not like chaos. Chaos is deterministic, and we don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think I think this is just it can because it's possible. I don't know that I believe this. I almost think it, Michael. Well, I think it, but I don't know that it's right. Well, you know, like uh, before we started recording, I was I, I mentioned to you that I'm a randomness skeptic. Uh huh. And you mean? And I, in, by which I mean that to define random as that in which, like, you know, a s- sequence of numbers in which we can determine no pattern yeah. suggests, like, you know, we miss something when we cut the subject out of that and the methodology out of that. Okay. You know, that it's not, that we're not really making a claim about the world as it is. We're making a claim about the world that we're, we're capable of modeling. Okay. So, you know, when I think about this issue of, you know, random genetic mutations, and I, I go down into the cell, and I go down into the genome. This, I, you know, I have to wonder: is this event not an event that is constrained by the second law? Sure. And if you know, and is it is it not constrained by a number of other factors, such that in some sense we're still talking about a, a, a system that is seeking rest, and therefore more likely to assume, like the the outcome of a mutation is more likely to take a, a certain shape than other possible outcomes, in which case it is maybe in some sort of primitive way, the same kind of thing that we see when you, you know, even though like it brings us back around, you know, when you're talking about, we don't need to invoke consciousness here, you know, and I'm not necessarily saying consciousness, whatever, but there's a sense in which our modeling of a situation, our evaluation of possible outcomes, and our selection of one particular choice, one particular course of action. I'm, a, I'm, I'm also like a free will skeptic in the sense that like the sort of random pattern duality or the free will determinism duality do not seem sufficient, that they, they seem to be more like products of particular ways of viewing a, a situation from different angles rather than a statement about the world as it is. And in that sense, like if you're weighing like to take this job or to take this other job, uh, you may not be able to predict the outcome of that, of that decision-making process, Mm -hmm. but you know, heuristically that there's a landscape, uh, you know, that you're, you're modeling and that your behavior is going to be the one that fits, you know, that, that provides the sort of optimal solution given the, the modeled landscape. And the same thing seems to be going on, at the genetic level, like, you know, or, or, you know, any kind of like prebiotic thing where it's not necessarily seeking equilibrium, but it is seeking you know, the lowest available energy state. And so it's not purely random and the randomness has more to do with our ability to actually measure the various, you know, like that we just don't see the mini golf course that this thing is on. There is, I think, and again, like Adi Livnot talks about this in terms of heavy and learning, you know, and the notion that genes that are regularly expressed together are going to end up fusing as just one example that he gives um, in his paper on this. And, and that the math that we use to describe genetic mutations is very similar to like inferential learning or there is some sense in which there's like a, a hill climbing algorithm governing these seemingly random processes. There's a sense in which I feel like you can take that and extend it to the other way in sort of the scale of things, things that we take to be non sort of non random as human actors in a civilizational system may appear to the civilization itself modeling its own internal dynamics as random, which is the problem basically of like modeling agents in economics, you know, like there's just insufficient Mm -hmm. information. You know, we know that people are making what they would consider reasonable decisions, Mm -hmm. but those decisions are constrained by a landscape that those decisions change. Sure. I mean, it just, yeah. What you're saying is kind of an informed and neatly intuitive mush. But that's yeah. okay. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's me. That's the no, show. No, that's okay. Kind of one ways of things. <laughs> Let me take you back to uh, where we were to point before. Okay. Yeah. I could, I've said this enough times so I could say it precisely. And it has to do with random. 
And Giuseppe Longo kind of taught me about this as we talked about it all. I, I realized, but he told me what I was trying to say, and he said it right. So let's take a coin and flip it a thousand times. We know ahead of time all possible outcomes, all heads, all tails, right? That means that we know the sample space of the process. That's it. And now we want to know whether or not, what's the probability that it'll come out of 523 heads and the rest tails? Well, we bring up the binomial theorem and we calculate it. And then we can test that we're right by doing it a bunch of times, right? But we know the sample space of the process. Now let's take the evolution of the biosphere into its adjacent possible, which we cannot pre-state. Mm-hmm. Or the evolution of the economy into its adjacent possible, which we cannot restate. So it's 300 years ago, and you would like to know the probability that 300 years from now you could sell a bicycle on eBay for $93.87. It's like the Drake equation. You got nothing. You got nothing. Yeah. You can't even say it. What that means is something I think is profound, and Giuseppe helped me realize it. Not only do you not know what will happen, you do not even know what can happen, right? Right. That means, among other things, you don't know the sample space of the process. Therefore, you can make no probability measure on it. None. Do so we you, ever really know the sample no, space, though? Like, truly? No. But, well, we do. We I don't. mean, even in but classical it, systems, aren't we just, like, bullshitting ourselves? Hang on, so hang on for a moment. Yeah. Because we don't know the sample space, we, do not, we don't have a probability measure on it. And there's something else that's existential about it. You cannot reason about that which you do not know can happen. You can't. So since the Greeks, for us, human reason, our capacity to reason, is the highest part of our humanity. Well, it's, it's a big part. Equally important is something else that we do that's magical. We make our way in a world when we do not know what can happen. And we do so anyway. And it's there all the time. It's there with venture capitalists who are making a bet on some technology. They don't really know what's going to happen. But they make a bet anyway. We keep making bets in our lives, and evolution does too, in the sense that random mutations get tried, and what wins, wins. So it becomes into an unprestatable adjacent possible for which there's no probability measure because there's no definable sample space of the process. And if there's no definable sample space, you can't even define random. You can define random perfectly good for flipping a coin a thousand times. It's a random sample. Right? And you can define random in quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics, you know, when you get the wave functions, you have all possible, you have a set of amplitudes, and for each one you square the amplitude, and the probability that it'll collapse to that is the square, of the, right? You can define the sample space in quantum mechanics too, but you can't for the evolution of the biosphere. This is really wildly radical stuff. We are driven beyond, Newton taught us how to do science. State the laws, the initial and the boundary conditions, and calculate. Quantum mechanics does the same thing, and it does. Schrodinger's equation is in the same framework as Newton. It's just that Schrodinger's equation, which is a linear wave equation, when integrated, gives you the deterministic evolution of a probability distribution, not the not how balls move, but it's still Newton's framework. But the whole thing falls apart for the evolution of the biosphere. Well, I'm going to ask what may be just like a stupidly naive question, but, you know, this coin flipping example is is like the example. It's always given. Yeah. And we always act as though it's heads and tails. Uh-huh. But it's also a slim possibility that the coin lands on its edge. Yeah. But you can put that in. Yeah. Heads, uh, 49.97, tails, 49. in edgies, you know, in pointsies. Right? Yeah. You can put that I mean, And then again, like, you know, to extend it again, it's, I, mean, I guess in some sense, I'm just like tilting a spear at the sufficiency of our models. But like, it, it seems as though a truly comprehensive model of a coin flip would include the possibility that there's somebody blowing on the coin sure. every time you flip it. No, no, you, no you're right. So you take the coin flip and you say, but the air is still. But mm-hmm. now you want to put in classical noise, so the wind comes. Well, so you just put in classical noise. You still know a formulatable probability distribution. For You know, you bow the thing, you put it in a room with a fan, okay? But it's in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you know the phase space, okay? It's the excitation levels in the sodium. Right, that gives you the absorption spectra. In evolution, you don't know the sample space. 
You just don't. And I don't think we've begun to take this in. I mean, Giuseppe and I and Milo have been talking about it for a few years. But if, if this is right, it's, it's really transformative. It really means that you can't do science the same way for an historical thing like the evolution of the biosphere that you could do in physics. You can't. There's no law for the evolution of the biosphere. But, but we may be able to make statistical statements, and it may be true that the adjacent possible of the biosphere tends to expand. That's, that, that may well be right. I, I'll stick my neck a tenth of an inch away out and say maybe it is. Uh, but, but it's not. I mean, it's not, it's not. That's why I've written a book called A World Beyond Physics. That's our world. So this seems like the time to get into the poised realm. Okay. Right. I got to go piddle. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Future Fossils. This podcast is a part of the MindPod network, along with numerous other excellent programs. Go to mindpodnetwork.com and subscribe to them all. If you'd like to help support Future Fossils, consider giving this show a five-star iTunes review or sharing it with someone you think might appreciate these conversations. For the second half of this wrap with Stuart Kaufman on quantum physics and consciousness, as well as copious additional extras, visit patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. And have fun exploring the adjacent possible.